Um, we have four uh, just outstanding panelists who are going to talk to us about immigration from a variety of angles. Um, uh, Michael Fix, John Spector, Gary Shapiro, Hilda Ochoa Brillenburg. And um, I think what we'll do, since we only have an hour and since we definitely want to get uh, questions and comments from the audience, I had a special request from someone to make this as heated as possible, uh, which we'll, we'll try. Uh, so I think what we'll do is I'm going to ask each panelist um, to first kind of give us um, just a lay of the land from their perspective. What have they seen in the latest research and their latest experience uh, on immigration? And each of our panelists has a certain uh, kind of dimension they want to talk about. After we do that, then I'd like to come back to each of them and talk about, so what should we do? What is, what is your policy idea? What is your policy fix? And ideally, how can we actually get that particular idea uh, done uh, and implemented? Um, and along the way, I know we have a lot of other uh, colorful stuff uh, that we'll talk about. So, John, I'd actually like to, to, to start with you, if that's okay, and kind of give us uh, your sense of, you know, immigration, its, its, its role in the labor force, and some of the trends that you're seeing today. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is going to be the least uh, excitable uh, answer, because the way we view immigration at the conference board is through the lens of economics and the economy, and in particular, through the lens of the labor force. Um, I, I think it's, uh, well, I, uh, I understood in advance that most of the panelists today and maybe most of the folks in the audience think that immigration from an economic point of view is a good thing, a flow of capital and flow of labor and so forth. The freer it is, the, the more efficient it is. We heard a little bit about that this morning. Um, but we are um, about to enter a period, uh, uh, an unprecedented period of labor shortages in the United States. Um, that probably doesn't feel exactly right to some of you, but some of you that are kind of noticing the macro statistics and maybe you're feeling it in certain industries um, already have seen this. We've, we've announced, uh, our analysis kind of predicted this about a year ago, uh, that it would start to happen about now, and it's going to start to accelerate. We're going to see wages rise, and we're going to see real shortages. And the reason for this, there are a lot of things about economi economics that are hard to predict, but the only thing that's not hard to predict is what's going to happen with the with demographics. And uh, over the last uh, 70 years, the labor force in the U.S. has grown by about 1% a year, maybe a little bit higher. It's now plummeting by next year or the year after. It'll be growing at two or three tenths of 1%. And it will stay at that essentially zero growth rate for the next 15 years. And we know that because we know how many, we know how many seven-year-olds there are and how many eight-year-olds there are and so forth. Uh, that's never happened. I don't mean that it doesn't happen often. This has never happened. And we're going to, we're going to start see, to see la real labor shortages. Um, in some areas, uh, and there's not much you can do about labor shortages. I mean, you can extend the life of, of the workforce. Immigration is another factor. And so I think that one of the major changes that we're going to see is that the context in which we all talk about immigration, in addition perhaps to it being very political, maybe that won't go away, but it's also going to become very economic. Uh, and that's going to become more and more intense as the years go by. And so it's possible that however frustrating it is now that we can't get anything accomplished, we're going to see unprecedented levels of pressure from an economic point of view to try to accomplish something with respect to immigration. So I just say sort of at the largest level, the economic dimension is going to, be in, is going to start to really intrude. And that's, I think, a good, a good force. Thanks, John. Uh, this point about demographics that John is talking about is it strikes me as one of the most important but often least kind of discussed issues. There was a, 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 an essay in Foreign Affairs and a book published last year called Depopulation. And even outside the U.S., there's some statistics, someone in here probably knows it better than me, that well over half the world's population now lives in countries that are, are losing, are depopulating. This is like, and we've never encountered this before. That's a great context. Uh, Michael, I'd like to move to you next, uh, and, and can you kind of give us a sense of what you're seeing from the Migration Policy Institute's work, especially on integration and, and the changing composition of, uh, of the American, uh, American immigrant population? Great. Thank you, Dane. Um, let me just start with my um, con context housekeeping favorite factoid, which is that the U.S. is home to about 4% of the world's population but it's home to about 20% of the world's immigrants. Now, when you think about immigration and immigration flows, there's lots of talk about a wall between us and Mexico. 
and I'm not certain that it's the best idea because to, from, what, from our perspective, what we see as the mass, one of the master trends of the last 10 years is falling undocumented migration from Mexico to the United States. And so the, what, why, what, what explains that? Well, there is a birth rate miracle in, tech, in, in Mexico. The birth rate has fallen sharply. We see a growth in the middle class in Mexico. And of course, we also see that the United States spends $18 billion a year on immigration enforcement already, which is more than we spend on all other areas of criminal enforcement combined. Um, so that's one trend. The other trend that we're looking at is a real diff change in the profile of immigrants coming into the United States. Recent immigrants in the 1990s, about 25% of recent immigrants in the 1990s had college degrees and were college educated. Today that number is about 45%. Uh, the way we used to look at immigration was we used to look at it as an hourglass. Large at the top, large at the bottom, narrow in the middle. Today, what we see in terms of immigration flows is they're almost equal in terms of the high-skilled, middle-skilled, and then much larger at the low-skilled. But still, there is a large flow into middle-skilled jobs. In terms of the topic Dane asked me to talk about, which is immigrant integration, I've had the privilege of working for the last two years on a panel of the National Academy of Sciences um, on the integration of immigrants into American society, and the findings are really quite striking. The findings are, in very short, that integration, immigrant integration, is proceeding apace. It's proceeding as it has historically. Immigrants are learning English as fast or faster than they have historically. Intermarriage rates are up today. This was my favorite fact. 35% of Americans claim they have a close kin of another race. Now, if you look through a social and economic lens, how are immigrants doing? And the lens we looked at at the National Academy was an intergenerational lens. Not so much how are the immigrants doing, but how are their children doing? And when you look at immigration through that intergenerational lens, you see sharp gains across all groups in terms of high school graduation, in terms of post-secondary access, in terms of earnings, in terms of declining poverty, where you don't see gains, is in health, health declines. Immigrants come in with better health and it declines to an American norm. But what you see in general, if you look at immigrant integration, is that America's immigrants are coming to resemble American natives. That's the real definition of integration and that's what we're seeing. Thanks, Michael. Um, Gary, I'd like to turn to you now. We've gotten kind of the, the economic and the, the data context from John and, and Michael. Give us a sense of what industry's perspective is on this. Why is it important? How does it matter? Well, we focus on innovation. Hello. So I represent 2,400 technology companies, the Consumer Technology Association, um, and there's a unanimous feeling on this issue that the government policy presently is wrong and it seems to be heading in the wrong direction. So first of all, you know, the US, with the possible exception of Israel, has the highest percentage of immigrants in the population. And I think that's, there's, there's a correlation between immigrant populations and innovation. And that is part of our strategy. Our diversity, our heterogeneity, heterogeneity is a strength. And that we see by any measure of innovation from startups to patents filed to whatever you, however you want to measure innovation. And if you look at the technology industry, which I represent, uh, about one third of our, our serious companies were started by immigrants. 44% um, of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are immigrants. If you look at what are called uni unicorns, these are companies which have a billion dollar valuations and they're relatively startup. More than half of the, these unicorns are immigrants. And what, what I hear about constantly is that, you know, we're faced as companies with, with serious problems. We can't start or expand a company with people we need because we need immigrants. And so we either have to go abroad and start, if you're a large company, you could form a, a subsidiary or a related company overseas, and then you could hire who you want. Or we could struggle and try to compete for those that are available. 
So the National Science Foundation spends, I think, about $6 billion a year pouring into universities for research. Most of that research is done by non-US citizens who we then proceed to kick out of the country when they're done on the most focused, advanced things. So then we're left with a population that is allowed to stay here uh, of, of STEM graduates that are, that's limited and everyone's competing for them. And those STEM graduates then are, you know, it's great to go to a startup or an exciting company like a Google or an Oracle or a Salesforce and they pick them up. You know who's left holding the bag on this one? is not only the startups, it's tough to start, and it's increasingly tougher with new rules that are, keep coming out of the administration, but what's left holding the bag is our defense industry. Our defense industry has no pipeline at this point. You talk to the defense industry CEOs, they will tell you this is what keeps them awake at night, because they have to have someone who's clearly a U.S. citizen, and they're competing with startups and with big companies with stock perks and high salaries, and yet we have a shortage of highly skilled people. If you have a cybersecurity degree and you're 21 years old, Undergraduate, you will make six figures to start. You're doing the data analysis or cloud computing or you're an app developer. These are, there are literally millions of jobs open in the United States and we're, we're shooting ourselves in, in the foot in a, in a very bad way and it, it's a horror story. There's one guy we work with who is, um, we helped him get uh, the ability to stay in the country about four years ago and he just wrote me to thank me again and tell me that the heart valve, the artificial heart uh, testing equipment that he created is now saving thousands of lives and he has 30 employees. And that's the kind of thing we're kicking out of this country and it's, it's frankly, it's heartbreaking. When you hear the presidential debates, you think we've, we're clearly going in the wrong direction. Gary has highlighted two or three things that I'll circle back to when we talk about what to do, in particular on immigrant entrepreneurship, which we'll hear from next. Um, some of the things that are being tried around the country to try to address the blockages that, uh, that Gary mentioned, um, as well as some of, um, uh, some of the other ways to maybe get around some of these bottlenecks. Hilda, we've heard the, the context um, from these gentlemen. You're an immigrant. You're also an entrepreneur, and it put a face on this for us. I mean, what, what, is this, what does this mean to this country, and kind of what's your story been? How have you experienced some of the trends we've been talking about here? Thank you, Dane. Can you all? Yes. Uh, I'm probably uh, a success story, and, uh, and I'm glad to say I'm a success story. I now belong to that 1%, that famous 1% in the U.S., I did not belong, not even near that, when, when I migrated to the United States, and I migrated as a, as a single woman uh, to the United States, came from a middle class background in Venezuela, spent 12 years at the World Bank, and in those 12 years I was training myself and developing a proof of concept to become an entrepreneur, which I did become 29 years ago. Started a firm that has become the leading privately owned um, uh, investment manager service provider in something that's called outsource CIO industry. So I have been successful. In terms of um, what does it mean for the not such successful uh, immigrant entrepreneur? Uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm, I'm, as an immigrant, I kind of wonder, how is it that this country has not sorted out its immigration policy? It's kind of crazy and because there's no doubt that there is so much contribution immigrants have brought to the country. Uh, there is no doubt that the country needs immigrants. In fact, I went and calculated the number of immigrants we need just to address the demographic pyramid problem. Over the next 20 years, we need to bring in two and a half million immigrants a year. We're currently bringing in about a million, a million two between legal and illegal immigrants. There aren't all that many illegal immigrants, net inflows anymore. So wh why is it that we did not put in, po in place a policy since the Reagan years uh, that, that, that addresses this issue? And I think the answer is that we decided the best policy was to turn the other way. Allow as many illegal immigrants to come in, hallelujah, not bad. We needed more workers that would cross the border and start working here, no one was complaining and it wasn't a crime. And there were enough H-1B visas to take care of the high level uh, needs of the country or entrepreneurial visas. And yes, from time to time you'd find some shortages, but they could be addressed. Well, that's no longer the case. We now have 10 to 12 million illegal immigrants in a, in a category of workers that have been somewhat criminalized. 
it has turned into a very acrimonious debate now in the electoral uh, period. And we need to fix the problem. And the question is, how did you fix a problem that has become so, so enormously, that it's so big, particularly considering what's ahead of us, and that has become so enormously politicized at a point in time in which many otherwise members of the middle class are nearing retirement, finding that they're impoverished because there are not enough savings to take care of their retirement needs and, and health needs. And, and what's gonna happen to women? Because I'm the one woman in this panel. We women, I personally benefited from the fact that I could, I could hire legal foreign workers to help me take care of the kids, help me cook, help me provide management services for my household while I was entrepreneuring. Uh, so what's gonna happen to those women who don't have access to that childcare that now we hear is worth $20,000 a year minimum, and that are now gonna begin having to take care of their elder parents. And it falls on women to have to take care mostly of the children and their elderly and infirm parents. So th this is, a, we are nearing now a critical point, not just for the population at large, but more specifically for women. Um. Those are excellent points, and, and now, um, now that we've kind of heard the opening comments from everyone to set the context, I'd like to move us into what can we do, um, and what are some of the specific ideas to address exactly some of those issues, Hilda, that you have raised. Gary, I want to bring it back to you, because we just heard from Hilda about immigrant entrepreneurship. It's something you talked about, about startups, um, and the importance of startups being able to employ a lot of the talent that are be, it's being trained at our universities, but also the immigrant entrepreneurs ourselves, there's a few things being tried around the country. A couple states, a couple universities are uh, exploiting um, some, not loopholes, but some, uh, some opportunities uh, within the H-1B visa program to employ entre entre immigrant entrepreneurs at universities. What are the, some of the things that we should do to open up these pathways and get past these bottlenecks that you identified and to let in more Hildas of the future? <laughs> Well, I think as a nation, first we have to define what it is we want, which we clearly haven't done. And you know, listening to the debates, it's it's a matter of exclusion rather than adding. And I, I'm I'm still honestly responding and thinking about what Hilda th said about the the angle I hadn't considered of the impact on women um, of restricting immigration. I mean, just for, for the sheer purpose of of economic growth. We need immigration. I mean, that's, and Hilda's point is we also needed to cover our social programs and provide help we need. I, I focus on highly skilled immigration as well as um, immigrants who are uh, fill, fill niches and get university degrees, which I guess are, are similar. But the entrepreneur immigrant, you know, there are, Canada, for example, has a pretty good program. The, the challenge when you have an entrepreneur and you say you could, um, if you create a certain number of jobs or a certain amount of money, you can come, is that there is a concern, sometimes legitimate, that, that basically you're, you're selling citizenship and it can be abused. Um, so those experiments are off and on. I don't think there's a lot of public support for those, frankly, especially right now. The highly skilled one, though, I mean, even Trump at one point in the Detroit debate, and I was sitting in the audience, he said, I've changed my mind about highly skilled immigration. I was the, if you hear someone yell, start clapping, I was the only one in all of Detroit in the audience and he started clapping and cheering. Everyone looked at me like I was crazy because I realized this is Detroit, my gosh, they are, uh, they're probably not that welcoming of immigrants there. So what could happen, what should happen? I think we gotta engage the defense community. I think we have to engage the startup community. I mean, I, I was, you know, this is Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook is starting to be more visible on these issues. And I think we gotta get out there. I think when you talk with most members of Congress, frankly, they are very sympathetic on this issue. I think we had legislation ready to move. It was, uh, it was clearly uh, able, capable of going through the House, of bipartisan, uh, the Senate, right now, the, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary, of the Senate Committee that has jurisdiction over this, rather, is uh, Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama. Not the most immigrant-friendly person you would imagine. So what do we need? We need to keep hammering on this issue. Right now, the pendulum of public opinion is clearly against us, but the numbers are on our side. I don't mean the, I mean the financial numbers that Hilda's talking about, the numbers that we need. Who's gonna fund Social Security? Who's gonna take care of the, the demographics of an elderly population which is living longer, and there's frankly fewer people to take care of them? 
uh, you know, we're doing what we can with technology to help, but we need people to do these things. And, and, but now there's a perception in America that immigrants replace Americans for jobs at a lower cost. And that's a really unfortunate perception. Yeah, you mentioned some of the pathways for different um, immigrants enter the country, including entrepreneurs. 15 countries, and you mentioned Canada's program. Canada is one of 15 countries that now have a startup visa program, although the U.S. is not among those 15 countries. Um, John, what, what do you think we can do here? I mean, you've talked about the labor market challenges. We've heard some specific ideas from Gary already. We'll hear some more to address some of these challenges. What can we do to... to to, to grow the labor force. Well, I think that the, the conference board is, we're sort of not advocates, so I probably w won't be as specific in terms of kind of legislation or, or things of like that. But I do think that the business community has a really important role to play here. And I think that there is something that's just as distasteful to the po to p segments of the voters uh, as immigration, which is outsourcing. Uh, and I think that there's you know, a, very, um, a very tangible, simple connection uh, if a big company, particularly a big company that can operate globally and does, can't find skilled workers in the United States to do certain things, there's only one thing that that company is going to do, which is to move those jobs overseas. And I think that uh, that's something that even uh, unsophisticated voters can understand. Uh, whether or not that sways their view or not is, is another matter. Uh, but I think it's important. And, um, you know, maybe we need to to change the name. Maybe we need to call it non-local workers instead of immigration. And maybe that would, for people who aren't paying much attention to the specifics, maybe that would uh, change the nature of the debate. How about bilingual? <laughs> yeah. All right, so John has given us a couple political selling points. Sell it as, as the defense against outsourcing and change the names. Um, Michael, I mean, sub, sorry. I mean, substantively, I mean, I support the. I, I think it, you know, dealing, making sure that we define the issue as the difference between high skill and low skill, and then targeting it very specifically towards occupations. I mean, I assume that was what everyone, what everyone meant in terms of specific policies. We've just released, or about a year ago, again, we released a report where we looked at 464 different professions and the likelihood of shortages. And so uh, that analysis and, and the experience of companies, it's very easy to target where these high skilled positions are. So the policy prescription, frankly, is pretty straightforward. It's take those places where there are shortages and adopt the visa policies to allow for it. So I didn't mean to be flip about my answer. No. Um, at some point, this has to become a sales job beyond the substance. Michael, how are we going to address some of these challenges? We've heard about the variation across industry from, from John and, and Gary. I mean, we hear often about labor shortages and STEM worker shortages, but clearly, you know, it varies by industry. Uh, Gary pointed out some of the defense-related industries uh, from high skill, low skill. What are some of the things we can do, the more nuanced policies we can put in place? Um, the way we've been thinking about this, we had a commission that was um, led by uh, Lee Hamilton that addressed these issues about 10 years ago. And, um, and the, the, that commission, uh, the bipartisan commission, came to the notion that we need to start addressing the rigidities in the immigration system. If you take the H-1B workers that we were just discussing, those limits were set in legislation in 1990 before there was an internet. Now visa, visa limits are essentially set by Congress. They're set every 10, 25 years. They simply cannot keep up with the economy and the dynamic changing economy. So the prescription that we came to was the creation of a standing commission on immigration and labor markets. And this would be a standing commission that looks a little bit like a sentencing commission, like a Federal Reserve, like a Bureau of Labor Statistics, that would advise the Congress in, biannually on off years so it didn't get tied up in elections, uh, and would produce an annual report. There are other things that we can do. We can have something called provisional visas. <coughs> The way the visa system was set up, there was initially supposed to be quite separate temporary visas here, permanent visas here. As it's turned out, permanent visas, temporary visas are the way we staff our high-skilled industries, and, under, and, and unauthorized immigration is how we staff our, our, our unskilled, unskilled industries. If you could create something along the lines of a provisional visa so that you came in on a temporary basis, but you could convert that to a permanent visa over, over time, that would help. It would help employers, it would help the immigrants themselves, and would also be a way to bring immigrants in, not just in high skilled, but in low and in middle skilled jobs, we believe. 
Felder, what are some of the things you think that this country can do to address some of the challenges you raise, and especially the home management, the, the, the challenges that you dealt with, but also some of the some of the some of the other issues we've heard about. Yeah, the, I think I'm a numbers person. Uh, I think we ought to find a way to pull together 50 to 100 million dollars <coughs> from corporate donors and uh, personal donors to start a marketing campaign rebranding immigration. I think the uh, the brand has been destroyed and the brand needs to be rebuilt. And uh, once you start with an intelligent public relations and branding campaign for immigration, then you start changing people's minds in addition to the corporate initiative, talking to senators, explaining to them, et cetera. You have to attack the, the branding issue, which is serious uh, from, from various angles. And the angle that we do very well at is, is brand, it's essentially PR campaigns and, and, uh, and branding campaigns, marketing campaigns, and those cost money. My understanding is 50 to 100 million dollars would do a good job at that. So that's step number one. I think the idea of having this temporary visas uh, is a way to, appe to, to appease uh, both sides of the argument. Uh, but I would use some of the behavioral tools that we now know work uh, in, 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 in a politicized country, which is I, was, I would make them automatically renewable for five years every year. So that if you want to cut that stream of legalized temporary workforce, you would have to act to stop it. Otherwise, it's automatically renewed every year for an additional five years. And of course, uh, and, and, uh, I, would, I, would, I would definitely install the, a nanny green granny visa, an elder care, um, home care, home management uh, visa under that same five year uh, rule because this is being ignored by everyone, including women, until they're gonna have a very rude awakening not far from now. Uh, Hilda, when we had our uh, preparatory phone call for this panel, you talked about, and this goes to the, the political sales point and the rebranding and kind of the PR campaign, <laughs> you talked about immigration more as a human capital issue and, and compared it to some other, um, you know, capital flows around the globe. And uh, would you say some more about that for this audience? Yes. Uh, we have achieved some of the highest growth rates experienced in the in the world because we have opened up trade and capital flows globally. And in a very puzzling way, we do not have the same types of freedom for human capital, for human beings. They're still highly constrained to move around. And it has occurred to me that the same way, and I hate creating another kind of multilateral governmental body because I'm more libertarian than anything else, but I, I have observed that bodies like the IMF and the World Bank and other regional banks, as, long, as well as universities that have been creating policies um, to support the, the global capital flow theory and systems, have achieved a smoothing of the way for global capital to flow freely. And on the trade, the WTA with all its dysfunctionalities, WTO, the World Trade Organization, has also been able to achieve some kind of a global coherence of trade policies. So I'm kind of wondering and kind of out of the box thinking whether in addition to all the things that we can do domestically, to change the course of immigration policy, whether we should not be starting an international effort to create what I would call, for, for lack of a better name, um, a global human resource bank, not to call it human capital because that sounds like slavery, but the, uh, a, 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 a sort of human resource bank that would, in essence, allow a global passport to certain types of immigrants and that would then escape the social security uh, safety nets, which are the ones that created a big commotion. You know, we will have these meme immigrants that are going to be coming in and we're going to have to supply for retirement and healthcare and all of that. No, it would be, so that's a kind of a wild thought 
far out just to get the policies and the universities and the thought process aligned into coming up with a global uh, immigration policy that makes sense because the problem is not just the United States. So you mentioned, of course, raising the H-1B caps, which is, is what we've been advocating for uh, with Congress, and we thought we almost had it. But I, I believe it's Australia that does a scoring system. And so I started out already saying we should define what it is we want. Well, we want highly skilled immigrants. We want hard workers. We should also define what we don't want. And I think you, you said it, Hilda, I hate to say it, but we don't want people that are going to strain the system. Um, and I think it's a personal view, but the family visa, if you will, the family immigration has strained the system. Yes. And if someone's going to come here, they ha you, know, you, you have to prove that they're going to carry their own weight or their family will carry their own weight. Because the problem is we're not getting the highly skilled people in because we're getting the families in all the time. And family upon family, you know, you bring your sister, bring your brother, they bring everyone else in. And then all of a sudden, there are burdens being put in the system. And, and any, even if it's a PR campaign, you have to acknowledge your weaknesses. And the weaknesses are, we have a system today which is, in some parts, straining the system. I like to do a point system. You know, you have a certain number of points for this, or points for that, points, and, and, and you add it up, and you let the high scorers in. And it's really simple. What jobs do you need? You know, right now, we let a lot of doctors in. And, you know, if you go to a lot of medical doctors at this point are immigrants, because we really do need them and want them. And in a way, when I go around the world, what I used to hear from my compatriots is not only medical doctors, but the PhDs and the others, is that we are bankrupting the other countries in the world of their human capital and their talent, because everyone wants to come here. We happen to be an attractive place. Now, that all turned around on September 11th, frankly. I was on the board then of George Mason University, and we saw a drop off, as did I think every university, applicants from abroad. And we had a you are not welcome sign. And the rest of the world is in Europe, in Canada, and other picked up on that. They're going after the best and the brightest of the world. Our national strategy should be we want the best and the brightest here on a worldwide basis. And, and we should be competing for them, not repelling them. And, th and they go to the front of the line as far as I'm concerned, because that's what makes us great. Now, I had a debate about this with a member of Congress whose name I will not share. And I said, we want the, the A students in the world. And he basically said, no, we want the B students, provided they're Americans. And I'm like, well, obviously, we disagree. I want the US to be the best country with the smartest people from attractive from around the world. And that is where we were until September 11th. And now, I don't think we're there anymore. Well, we want the best and the brightest, but we also need service providers. Oh, I agree with you. The and way you, uh, and yes. So we need immigrants at every level. At not just at the, well, not at every we level. Want we want them at the, the levels where we're, we're short, and we're and we're short in some service provider levels. I totally agree. Um, the statistics are the boring statistics are. I think about 60% of our visas go uh, to family, and about 16% of visas go to employment. Now. Having said that, I think we have to recognize that the immigration system serves more than economic purposes. It has a humanitarian purpose, it has a social purpose, and it has a diversity purpose. It serves those three different purposes. And so to say that we don't want to go to family, what, when you think about family, most visas, most immigration visas go to immediate family members of US citizens. So in a way, immigration is a service to citizens in the United States, and that's where most of those visas go. That's not to say that we pay enough attention to employment. That's not to say that we have enough visas to go to employment. That's not to say that we have an intelligence system in that way, no. But let me just point, can I make one other point? Which is that we have another set of talents that we waste in the United States, and that is high-skilled immigrants who have a college degree or more who are working in unskilled jobs. It's your basic doctor driving an Uber. You know, and our analysis shows that there are about two million immigrants in the United States with a college degree or more who are working in low-skilled jobs or who are unemployed. It's very different state by state. They're highly concentrated in New York. They're highly concentrated in Florida. You don't see them so much in Michigan. You don't see them so much in Ohio. But it is an issue that it, it is a, you know, so we, it's kind of the worst of all policy worlds. It's brain drain in the sending country, and it's brain waste here in the United States. Women, it, it's gen, it's, it, women, women are more likely to be underemployed than are men. But if you look over time, women, women's underemployment rates falls, but men's do not. So. 
Yeah, I, I just want to add. There's a there's another. Uh, I think there's another axis that isn't talked about much. But I think because it is uh, immigration policy has always been kept appropriately in the past at the federal level. And talking about moving it to the state level, I think it becomes a political statement because of the way that a, few, you know, a handful of states have gotten involved in the issue in the last couple of years. But thinking about it through a purely economic lens, the states have very different stakes in the immigration issue. When we look at labor shortages, and we look at the 10 states that are least affected, the 10 states that are most affected, and this relates not just to, the, it relates to the age and the population, number of, of births and number of likely deaths and so forth. The 10 states that are most affected by labor shortages, it's going to be pretty extreme for the economy, but they have it 30 or 40 percent worse. And so if there were a way to, and I don't think this has been done to date, again, for the reasons that I stated, if there were a way to engage particularly those states, in the same way that we engage industries which have particular shortages, if we engage those states, these are, I can tell you that the citizens of those states, again, I, I live in Vermont, I'm one of those, I think Vermont is the worst or the second worst on that index. We are all very aware of the relationship between population and population growth and the economy. And, uh, and I don't think that it's a, I don't think it's, I think it is connected that in, in a place like Vermont, you know, anti-immigrant uh, fervor is not that high because we understand the connection between labor supply and growth and we all feel it intimately. So I think that that's another dimension. I think, as I said, there are real risks of devolving policy leadership to the states because we don't know exactly what they'll all do with it. But it, it is a huge economic pressure point for some states and that's an opportunity I think that has not been pursued in the past. Yeah, this is really interesting because despite uh, immigration obviously being, you know, the prerogative of federal law, there's a space for states, including on the reciprocity of foreign trained professionals, as we've heard, and in the absence of action from uh, the federal government and many states, a lot of cities and counties have stepped in within the strict limits of what they can do, but there are organizations like Welcoming America that are working with cities and counties to at least make themselves more attractive and cities trying to attract the foreign born and, and immigrants to their cities and, and some of them have, have succeeded actually quite well. Um, I want to get to uh, audience questions and discussions but I want to uh, give each of you a chance that you know if, if you were um, on Capitol Hill and if you had one thing that you wanted seen in, a, in, a, in an immigration reform uh, you compromise on everything else what's the one thing that you would not want to see die, that you, ha that you would want uh, to get done on immigration. Gary, you want to start? The one thing that I, w I want highly skilled immigration. I mean, that's the raise the caps. So raise the cap. Raise the caps. I agree. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Well, this will irritate everyone. <laughs> um, I think you've got to deal with the undocumented unless you want a really serious underclass in America. There are 12 million undocumented immigrants, roughly, and they have um, 4 million citizen children. And the social science is now becoming very clear that though that it's not that disadvantage doesn't just fall to the undocumented immigrants, but the, the legal status and the disadvantages of legal status are now having developmental and educational effects on the second generation. As I said, the second, the defining characteristic of America has been the success of the second generation. If you want to break that defining historic success, you'll do nothing about the undocumented. I fully agree with that. It is, so we, we actually invited them in. They didn't come by force. They were welcome because we needed them when our economy was growing at a very fast pace. The, it's important to know that every immigrant, legal or illegal, that comes in the into the United States specifically, saves us in the order of $500,000 of educational room and board cost in raising that immigrant to the working age. Therefore, a million immigrants saved us every year that they came into the country, a little under a trillion dollars. So when you wonder, how was it that this country was able to do so much with at some points negative savings rate? That's the reason why we were able to do so much. We were importing human capital into the United States legally or not so legally. So it is, it is an unbelievable source of assets 
which at some point could turn around and become a liability if we do not put in place intelligent policy. So I do agree that we have to do something with the illegal immigrants. My silver bullet there, it doesn't matter, my silver bullet there is to put in place this temporary worker visa permits for five years that are renewable because no one will bother cutting them off. Once they're in place, they will continue being renewed. And it's at some point it really becomes a problem, then you start, you stop them. And, and that's, that's my silver bullet for Congress. <laughs> All right, we have a, uh, a hard stop at 15 after, I'm told. So uh, we've got about 15 minutes for um, questions to open it up. Hi, Kathleen Mystery, Mystery Enterprises. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on requiring English language proficiency. Yeah, I'll go first, <laughs> since I had to become proficient in English, sort of. The, uh, I think, should be uh, required. Uh, not before migrating, but definitely within two to three years. And, uh, or else you are, oh, that is something. <laughs> We're gonna sound like Trump now. <laughs> or else you, you gotta have some kind of punishment. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it should be required uh, at some point. And that may be an incentive for renewing your, your temporary visa. I'm not for it. I'm not for it because one of the things this country has not done and spent very much money on is its immigrant integration policies. We have among the most generous immigration policies in the world, but we have among the, the most negligent immigrant integration policies. We spend pitifully little in terms of English language proficiency at the federal level, and less, you know, and, and the burden has really fallen, as this is said, to the state and to local and to civil society in the United States. And even with the reauthorization of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, even with this very interesting reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, still there is this mismatch between our interest in having people speak English and what we're willing to pay to, have to help them learn English. English. Half of U.S. foreign-born workers are limited English proficient, as it turns out. It is a real issue. So if you want to require it, you're go it's going to have a massive ripple effect. I think that's a very humanitarian and a correct point of view. My hope was that requiring it we would make it available <laughs> for immigrants to learn English. I don't know the answer to the question because it's a difficult one. My, my wife and her parents are immigrants and they came from Poland and uh, her parents were doctors in Poland and they came here not speaking English and they had to study English and retake the medical boards. And it's worked, but it was very, very difficult and lots of years of living in slums to do that. Um, but my wife, on the other hand, learning English as a second language is now multilingual and, and, and traveling I realize that as Americans, we suffer because we're arrogant in our English, and I'd like to see a little more language training. And, and our own children, not only uh, they speak Polish as a first language in the home, but also we struggle so hard to get Chinese women to live with us. We have a au pair, it's like a third one, so they, they can speak Chinese fluently. Um, so we're trying to walk the walk and talk the talk of multilingualism. On the other hand, we have to ask ourselves who we are as a country. What is it that connects us besides geography? And I strongly believe it's a culture. It's an immigrant culture. It's the sense that we could do things better, that we could have a better life. It's what we believe in. And I think part of it is a language. I spent part of the week uh, down in Miami, believe it or not, with a bunch of, um, well, bilingual English and Spanish, but a lot of French Canadians. And I think Canada is a great country, but it's suffering over two languages, frankly, a strongly held view on both sides. And I think we should be one language. I mean, but on the other side, I think we have to welcome the best and the brightest and give them the opportunity to learn English, and they should want to learn English. Other questions? Yep. Uh, just a quick question. How much is the immigration debate now really a, a thinly veiled of uh, racial and religious phobias that are going on in the in the country, and what's you know what's a termination of causing us not to have good policy because of those phobias? Uh, I'll actually <laughs> venture out on that one. Um, I think the most charitable 
response would be to say that, that the reaction is an economic reaction. Again, I'm looking at this through an economic lens. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard, I think. It's difficult. You know, you know I, I work in an organization that's filled with lots of economists. And sometimes the macroeconomic long-term truths of econo economics are hard to pick out in a short, when, you have, when you're not an economist and in a short-term lens. And the, just the very simple math of company X moves 50 jobs overseas or, or an immigrant comes in and gets employed, it, it's difficult sometimes to understand how that isn't harmful to you, especially if you don't have a job. So I think the most charitable interpretation would be is that people are, wrong, are seeing a set of facts and wrongly interpreting them because they're not economists. And in the short term, they're saying, this hurts, uh, this hurts me. Um, and that's not completely, you know, it's, it's factually, I think, wrong in the long term, but it's not irrational. There's a less charitable interpretation also. I would agree with that. And when I was thinking of immigration policies and the need for reform and enlightened immigration policies, I say, well, when we change the name, maybe it should be called human resource management policies because the other side of an enlightened immigration policy is that you do address the problems of training that the U.S. population is having, both for people who have lost their manufacturing jobs and may never recover them, as well as for people that for one reason or another are falling by the wayside in the public school system. So I do believe that there, 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 there are two sides to this immigration story. And the other side, or the more comprehensive, holistic side, is a human resource management policy for the country that takes care of the training needs of the whole population, both the immigrant as well as the, the local. And I think there the, the role of, of corporate America is a significant one in places where that they've been able to transform they, themselves from Rust Belt to Brain Belt. They've really transformed themselves. Akron, Ohio is an example, or Eindhoven in Holland. I just have a partner of mine who just wrote a book on this called The Great, The Smartest Places on Earth. They have been able to do so because there had been a coalition between their, their companies, the university hubs, and the local governments to make a change in the training, in taking advantage of whatever technical expertise exists in the place and expanded that training more broadly. So we need to do that here. Well, you've raised a very good question that we haven't even addressed. And I think what, when we're seeing uh, cultures that we don't understand or, or people, uh, you know, trying to kill thousands of people or use nine-year-old girls and raping them or putting explosive devices on them. And we just don't understand it and we fear it. And I think that's a natural human expression. But, but we also have to realize that here we are in this nice hotel and nice bright people in the Washington area. We're not average Americans, folks. I mean, you go to a little town in Alabama where, you know, most people don't even have a passport and have never been in Washington, D.C., and they all know each other all their life, and they just maybe the biggest thing they've had to deal with are race issues. With one race, they may have never seen a Hispanic, and now they're being told that we should let, you know, all these people from around the world that could be terrorists in their view into the country. It is alarming, and that's why one of the party's leading presidential candidate not only wants a wall, he wants to block all Muslims from coming into the U.S., I mean, it's not our most honorable moment, but the reality is we're not a representative sample of Americans. And, and I don't know if it's PR or repositioning or education or what it is, but we are suffering from the fact that, in a sense, the terrorists are winning because we look how what we've become in, in our thinking as a nation. And I think it's a matter of getting political candidates out there which will lead in a way where, where they could define what our shared values are and who we really are and what we came from. And sadly, I mean, I don't see that in personally in any of the candidates, which is maybe why I'm depressed lately. Uh, it's, it's, gone the, it's gone the total opposite direction, on, on not only on the value of immigration, but on the value of trade. And the debates that are occurring are all on both sides as to how much we can restrict these things and get away from them. And, and maybe Democrats will have an advantage if we have more immigrants or Republicans don't like it. And it's, it's not the kind of dialogue which makes me proud to travel abroad, frankly. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting question to which I have no answer, um, but we'll try anyway. It seems to me like we're in a moment of kind of a perfect storm of um, security anxieties that we just talked about. I think we're still suffering very much a hangover from recession-driven economic an anxieties. And I think the whole race question and status questions, legal status questions, are very much conflated in America. And when you put those three together, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's unhappy, but it is in some ways not so shocking that we as well as Europe have come, have come, to, have come to this place. Now, if you look to the future, there are two things that look, that, that may change things a little bit. First, you know, uh, increasingly migration to the United States will be Asian and not Latin American. And second, this point that I made, you know, that 35% of Americans say they have a close kin of another race. We are just changing and we will change out of these attitudes at some, at some point in time. Um, this point about community reactions and fear also raises another related point is that there are also communities that are recognizing the benefits of immigration. I mean, I, I live in Kansas, and Western Kansas is the last place you would think of as uh, probably immigrant, immigrant friendly, but there are towns and counties that are now majority minority, uh, Dodge City, Garden City, Liberal, uh, way out in rural Kansas, and there's reasons they are, but it's changing a lot of minds for the for longtime residents there who have, who have then told their politicians that, you know, that they've saved these, these towns. Our towns would die otherwise without this influx of immigrants. So you see the flip side to, to this point is that you see a lot of communities um, you know, welcoming those immigrants because it's, it's saving where they've, where they've grown up and, and where they've lived. We probably have time for one more question and I hope we can um, then end on, on, an, on an optimistic, hopeful note. Is that, is that too much to add? You said you were depressed, but well, I don't know. <laughs> just about the president. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I should hand the mic to someone else then. I, I'm Ken Simonson with Associated General Contractors of America. The construction industry is one that definitely benefited from having medium-skilled immigrants and lost a lot of them in the recession, particularly as home building declined. Uh, in the last four years, the industry has been hiring workers at double the rate of the overall economy, but now the pool of unemployed former construction workers is at an all-time low, and I think if we aren't attracting or aren't able to bring back in those workers from other countries, that uh, we're, we will see a, a real uh, deterioration in construction activity, and uh, with it, all of the benefits that come in housing and industries that are using uh, structures. And so I hope that if we do open the doors somewhat, it won't just be to STEM workers or ones defined as high-skilled, but would include ones with craft skills, too. Uh, just a brief comment. Yeah, the labor shortages in, in the skilled trades, we can call it that, are pretty severe. And uh, at least based on our analysis, immigration is not likely to be as effective a tool in those industries, uh, partly because of the preferences and the history of p past immigrants. Uh, and so that's not a very satisfying answer. Uh, it, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have policies that that treat that as a shortage and then give, you know, give allowances for those specific industries. But, uh, but we're not as hopeful in that area as opposed to in healthcare, for example, where we think immigration, where there are labor shortages and where we think immigration based on, on the nature of the people who have in the past immigrated and what their skills were, we think uh, there's a much greater chance that immigration can play a role in solving that shortage in other industries like healthcare. So I think it's gonna differ by industry. Oh, I would just say about the construction, one of our, one of our analysis of immigrant integration, and we were looking at, 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 at immigrants in middle skill jobs, what we found was that the construction industry was the one industry in which people who don't speak English and who had, did not have legal status could have middle skill jobs to pay family supporting wages. It was very interesting in that respect. All right, now I want to allow each of you, if there are any closing, hopefully optimistic remarks you want to make about <laughs> immigration policy to kind of to, to, to take us home. I believe in this country and I believe that it can change positively and I believe that with, with leadership and people speaking up and expressing opinions that are thoughtful that you can sway public opinion. I, I don't know about PR campaigns and whether that would matter that much. I think you just need leadership and I think people need to stand up and be heard. And I believe we're in a very, very moral country. And the morality sometimes is focused on things which become litmus tests like abortion or immigration. And I'd rather they be, whether welcoming. 
Uh, being Jewish and being raised with the concept that the U.S. turned away potentially millions of Jews that could have lives could have been saved, I was raised with the concept that, that immigration is good. And seeing what's going on in the world, I, I'm disappointed to embarrass that we're not more welcoming, and I wish we were. But on the other hand, I, I see and I feel the fear that people have, the real honest fear they have of, of people that are different, of terrorism, and of people of different cultures. And I just wish there was a way, and I'd like to see some solution, whether it's states or community-based organizations, others saying, look, we'll adopt immigrants, we'll do it. They step up, because it's a moral duty, I think we have as human beings now, to reach out to others in a time of crisis. So as much as I value high, highly skilled immigration for the future of our country and our defense industry and our, our leading innovation, I also think whether it comes to dream children or it comes to those that are really at risk in other countries, and leaving to save their lives, that we, we be a little more open and welcoming to them. Well, I would say personally, um, I, I agree from a moral or uh, a point of, point of view of who we are as Americans. I agree completely with what you just said. Uh, professionally, I, I just remember that a president once said, it's all about the economy, stupid. And I think that that's going to uh, be a very important positive factor. It makes me optimistic that there'll be some things we can accomplish in the future that we haven't accomplished in the past. Um, I think a lot about immigrant integration, and when I look at immigrant integration, I even see green shoots in recent federal policy. I see green shoots in our workforce policies, which are much more attentive to English language learners than they have been in the past. Green shoots in our education policies, which are very, very, very good when it comes to English language learners. And as I think to the future, I think in terms of this population that I talked about, the high-skilled immigrants who are underemployed, I think we're at an inflection point where places like Detroit and places like Akron and places like that really feel like they need, this is a, this is a brainwaves population that we can do something with. There are a lot of lessons to be learned, for example, from veterans and the recertification programs for veterans. There's lots of lessons to be learned from civil society, from organizations like Upwardly Global. There's a lot we can learn from states. I think we're at a point where we might be able to mobilize and work effectively on this concrete, important talent issue. Hilda, you get the last word. Yeah, you, need, you have to be optimistic because it's such an enormous problem then uh, with its own solution attached to it that, that something has to happen. But I firmly believe that we should help make it happen. And that one of the ways to help make it happen is to put money behind it and, and do engage in a PR and uh, rebranding, uh, intelligent rebranding campaign. All right, let's thank all of our panelists for addressing a very difficult topic.